Nico Kimson, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and now live in New York City. And uh, fun fact, as I entered college, I really wanted to be an OBGYN. I know you don't want to. <laughs> I'm still Stephanie, and still from Texas, by way, and, and here in New York as well. Um, and I played the oboe for seven long years. I hated every moment of it. Aww. But it was really good for me. <laughs> and maybe if you can stand so everyone can see you, yeah. that would be great. So go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Josefina Lopez from Los Angeles from Casa 0101 Theater. And the fun fact about me is that I've witnessed nine exorcisms and I aspire to be an exorcist. <laughs> wow. 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 <laughs> okay, hey everyone. I'm Daniela Tom. I live in New York, originally from Madison, Wisconsin, via Chile. Fun fact I um, play the alto saxophone sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Michael Robertson from The Lark here in New York. Um, I'm just struggling for a fun fact. Um, <laughs> I studied Balinese dance for a year when I was in Indonesia. Hi, everyone. My name is Annabelle Guevara. I'm from Laredo, Texas, but I'm here now in New York, uh, TCG, and my chihuahua has one eye. Teresa Byron. Um, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland originally. What else am I supposed to say? Fun fact. Fun fact. Um, sticking with the music theme, my roommate is a baby grand piano. And <laughs> um, hi, I'm Megan Gomez. I'm from Allentown, Pennsylvania, but I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico now. A uh, fun fact about me is that um, I did gymnastics from when I was two to when I was 10. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tanya Perez. I live here in New York. And um, fun fact is um, 
For money, I'm a clown, CPR instructor, and a self-defense uh, instructor. So I can take your life, <laughs> bring it back, and make you laugh. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sofia Maikushim. I am from Mexico City. I now live in uh, Portland, Oregon. And a uh, fun fact, I have over 50 pets. Wow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Lori. I'm originally from South Florida, but now I live here in New York. Uh, my fun fact is I played a 14-year-old at the Tenement Museum for two years. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Carlos. I'm originally, originally from Colombia, but I live here in the city. And my fan, fun fact is that I can't keep a plant alive. I keep trying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to do it. I have a black thumb. My name is Carlos. I'm originally from California, but now here in New York. And a fun fact about me is that I will finally be getting my driver's license in January. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Elaine Romero. I'm from California originally, and I live in Tucson and Chicago. And my fun fact is I once spent a week with Mother Teresa. <gasps> oh. Whoa! Uh, hello, my name is Tiffany Vega, I'm originally from East Harlem, now in New Orleans, Louisiana. And a fun fact is, um, I was that girl at marching band that played the xylophone. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie Fadul. I live in Brooklyn. I grew up in New Hampshire and was born in Columbia. Um, I, fun fact is, I figure skated for a long time growing up. Um, hi, my name is Kayla Buffoni. I am from Southern California, but I currently live in Houston, Texas. And my fun fact is that I'm an inspire, aspiring ukulele enthusiast. Hi, I'm Trevor Buffoni from Houston, New Orleans, both. Uh, and fun fact, I follow more dogs than humans on Instagram. <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard Marino. This is our theater, Teatro Seo. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. I'm from a small island off the east coast of the United States called Manhattan. I guess you guys heard of it. <laughs> and fun fact is uh, I grew up being a jock, and I still call the dressing room a locker room. And <laughs> intermission, <laughs> halftime. <laughs> Hello, I'm Maribel Alvarez. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. And a fun fact is that I freak out my students the first day of class telling them that in my former life as a hip hop artist, uh, I was known as Dr. M. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Ashley Ortiz. I'm from Fable, North Carolina, but mm -hmm. live in New York City. A uh, fun fact about me is I, I run marathons. <laughs> Hi, my name is Maria Cristina Fuste. I'm from Puerto Rico. I live in New York. And fun fact, I don't know, I'm obsessed with Brazil and I been studying samba, trying to learn samba for two years. I went to Brazil a couple of weeks ago, and I can't really dance samba. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Annette Ramos. I live in Rochester, New York. A uh, fun fact is that I have a twin sister and a younger sister who's 11 months apart. So we freak our friends out a lot. <laughs> Hi, I'm Viviana Vargas, and I'm from New York. My parents are Colombian and Ecuadorian, and a fun fact is that I used to be a lifeguard. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alyssa Gomez. I'm from the Bronx, and fun fact about me is that up until halfway through senior year, I was convinced I was going to be a paleontologist with my own TV show on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Magdalia Cruz, and I'm New Yorker from the Bronx, and I have so many fun facts, but one will be that I started college as a math major. <laughs> hey, my name is Elisa Bocanegra. I'm a Boricua from New York. Um, I currently divide my time between Los Angeles, where I run a theater company, and the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, where I'm in residence in PCG. And I guess a fun fact is that I play the trumpet. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Shirley Kenya. I was uh, born in Chicago, and now I live in New York. 
And a fun fact, I guess, is that I lived in rural Maine and worked in a sawmill. <laughs> Good morning. I'm San San. Um, I'm from Boston. Uh, my heart is still really in Hawaii and San Francisco. Um, I'm a little, I'm grateful that we're talking about facts because Trump surrogates don't believe in facts. And so, <laughs> so I'm glad that we're talking about them. Um, and a uh, fun fact, I guess, is that I love pandemics and I really want to be reincarnated as a pandemic. Doctor. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Marilyn Ford Barrera. I'm currently in Ashland, Oregon. And my fun fact is maybe an odd fact, which is I can fit my whole fist in my mouth. My name is Chris Yamila Correa. Pleasure being here. I am from Jersey City, New Jersey, inner city Jersey girl, Boricua. And my fun fact is at the age of 22, when I took a job as Ugly, uh, Ugly Betty at a magazine company, I had to serve salmon to my boss. And then I threw a party for Alicia Keys two weeks after. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Oscar Cabrera. Uh, I'm from Lubbock, Texas, but I live here in New York. Um, a fun fact is I can wiggle my ears. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Diomarji Nunez. I'm Dominican, raised in Miami, living here now. And a fun fact is uh, my first acting experience, I played Mrs. Satan in a nativity <laughs> thing that we did in school. I don't know why yeah. Satan had a wife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've played Satan since, like two years ago, so I'm hoping to keep that going. <laughs> Career Satan. That's awesome. Hi, I'm Bryn Packard, and I once had an industrial acting job where I got to drive a truck on an active runway at O'Hare Airport. And then after I was done with that job, I jumped in my U-Haul and moved here. That was three and a half years ago. Where are you from? Chicago. <laughs> I'm David House. I'm uh, from Murfreesboro, Tennessee originally, but I've been in Boston for 25 years. And uh, my fun fact is that I eat um, three desserts a day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's living, man. You're going to be my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Ivan Vega. I, was, uh, I am from Chicago, live in the Humble Park community, and I run a theater called Urban Theater Company, which is based in Humble Park, Puerto Rican community. Fun fact is, uh, both of my parents are Puerto Rican, but I grew up in La Villita, Little Village, which is the Mexican community of Chicago. They had a Mexican grocery store that was called El Mexicano with a picture of Vicente Fernandez in the front. So I grew up thinking I was Mexican. That was Hi, I'm Noe Montes. I'm uh, from Boston, uh, originally from Texas. And a uh, fun fact about me, in 1993, I placed 19th in the National Spelling Bee. Wow. <laughs> uh, I'm Jesse. I'm from Salt Lake City. And I am trying and failing to learn Korean. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tara. I was born in Tucson, and I now live in East Texas. And my fun fact is I've accidentally taught my dog how to spell dog. <laughs> <laughs> Ramona, I know you're, you're doing, but you should still. <laughs> uh, I'm Ramona. I'm from Boston. Uh, and I think this is my first time speaking on a live stream. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Elena Arauz. I'm originally from Connecticut. I'm Peruvian American, and I live here in New York. And my fun fact is that um, in graduate school, I used to be a competitive salsa dancer. Um, and then I married a white guy, and I don't do it ever. <laughs> I lost it all. for 
having us in this beautiful space um, in front of this amazing set, La Gloria. It's a fantastic. Um, I also just wanted to remind everyone that, um, you know, the way that we've structured the convening uh, is, is through the lens of aesthetics, identity, and leadership. And um, the happy feedback that we received in our planning was that uh, people found it really difficult to pick which track you wanted to be a part of. So I think that's great. And uh, the hope uh, is that whatever you learn here today, you're able to then share that knowledge with your communities um, in your cities, but also with the other attendees so that there's actually a real exchange of information and that there's a synergy between these three buckets. So I just wanted to remind everyone about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to erase this now. Um, and we're going to start with uh, language matters, defining leadership. So um, when we think about leadership, um, or what makes a good leader, um, what are the words that come to mind? Um, and I think we're going to just do uh, just some popcorn, as I mentioned. Um, uh, and this thing is a little... There we go. Okay. <coughs> so, anyone? Inspirational. Inspirational? Vision. Vision. Creating a new possibility for community. Oh. Okay, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, maybe Nico and I can yeah, tag team. Thank you. Facilitator. Authenticity. Risk taker. Passion. Driven. Boom. Listener. Fearless. Commitment. Political. Ownership. Innovator. Mm -hmm. Strategist. Listener. Colleague, not superior. Ooh. Ooh. Kindness. <laughs> Accountable. Transparency. Community Party leader. leader. Uh, what was that? Community? Community leader. Mm. Conviction. Conviction. Strong. <laughs> Servant. <Yeah. clears throat> Vision. I have vision. Impact. Impact. Empathy. Ooh. Shared. Ingenuity. Learner. Ooh. I want to spell ingenuity. <laughs> I like no, it. Like I like Results. Flexible. <laughs> Forward thinking. 
Teachable. So, um, just so that the words are out uh, in the space, I'm going to just read read them. Um, so, humility. So, humility, charismatic, honest, possibility, driven, flexible, kindness, mediator, partner, sane, innovator, <laughs> listener, conviction, learn, learner. Yes. I can't write. Yes. Learner. Okay. <laughs> Strong, inclusive, humble, all embracing, communicator, community organizer willing to be wrong, political, a strategist, a listener, a unifier, as empathy, as a teacher, as a risk taker, compassionate, as a community leader, is uh, nimble, um, uh, uh, a colleague, not superior, courageous, facilitator, um, bold, fearless, respectful, uh, inspirational, authentic, has vision, is not crazy, <laughs> um, reflective, <laughs> um, ingenuity, shared curiosity, impact driven, um, and who's a servant. I think that's all really, really beautiful. And I just, you know, I just wanted to take a moment, like I said, to have all of our voices in the space. Um, because the thing is, is that leadership is actually a challenging thing. Um, and it's uh, ever expansing. Uh, but there are two people who I really love and respect um, and who I think actually embody so much of what we've captured mm -hmm. here who I thought we could really hear from. Um, and I asked them to basically think of two kind of guiding questions, which is, um, you know, how, what does being an agent of change mean to them? But also, um, how do we activate or uh, use leadership to tell the kinds of stories that we want to tell to actually better serve our community. So that's Sharifa Joka from the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Yes. Uh, and Stephanie Ibarra from the Public Theater. Um, and so I think I'm gonna just turn it over to them. I've asked them to share a little bit about uh, their background, where they come from, and then uh, to share some reflections. Uh, and then we'll go from there. So uh, Stephanie, Sharifa, who would like to go first? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Agent of change. What was the other question, Jay? Um, how, how do we use, how do we leverage leadership to uh, tell the stories that we want to tell to affect change? Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I currently am the director of special artistic projects at the Public Theater, which means, like, what does that even mean? It means that I run the mobile unit uh, on behalf of the public, and I co-lead the public forum with uh, my partner in crime, Michael Friedman. So on the one hand, I run a program that is uh, solely about like getting out into the community and taking the work of the public to the people. And on the other hand, I run uh, a sort of like theater of ideas, audience engagement, artistic enhancement um, program. So I, I feel like I get all the all the good things. Um, in um, I don't feel like I want to go too far into my actual background or whatever. If you want to know more about my resume, you can Google it. But I do think um, this question of like, who, what does it mean to be a leader um, is a thing that I feel like I've grappled with my entire career. Um, and I, several, several, several years ago, somebody asked me this question. Um, they said, what kind of leader do you want to be? I was at a, a sort of crossroads. I had a choice to make. It wasn't like an earth shattering choice, but um, when I asked for this advice, the response was, well, what kind of leader do you want to be? And it, it hit me like a ton of bricks because I, I uh, ever since then, have, when I hit the, the crossroads, when I don't know what to do, that's usually, I go back to that question. It's like a touchstone question. What kind of leader do I want to be? What kind of producer do I want to be? What does this decision mean for my values and for the way I walk through this world? And what does this decision mean for those same set of values? And which will reflect um, which is which decision is more closely aligned with my values. So 
So that's just a little bit about how I come to leadership. Um, in terms of, do I answer all of the things right now, or do I, or does Sharifa say more about herself? <laughs> That's hilarious. We can, we can tennis. We yes, can tennis. Yes, I love tennis. <laughs> um, so um, the the very sort of brief summary of my background is I came out of uh, working in film and television in multiple capacities, primarily as a producer and sometimes as a programmer, curator of art programs. Um, and then I was introduced to the world of theater in my current position at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, um, where I manage a professional development program called Fair. Um, and it's interesting because I think that there's no question that I, I accept the fact that, you know, I'm a leader in certain ways, but as I walk through the world, I don't necessarily have that, um, that sort of title or position in my head. Um, I'm really clear that we all have the ability to take on leadership roles and we can lead initiatives and we can lead things. Um, and I think that there's a part of the, there's a politic that I have that I didn't quite know was a politic until I began to meet people who didn't share that politic. I sort of felt that it was, you know, this the natural thing that human beings want to do. But I think that um, I come from a history of working with uh, large institutions, whether it was film or whether it's theater, and those institutions are well resourced and they have the ability to change people's lives. And I always felt like in, in those positions that part of my job was to make sure that the people who were not in the institution had access to the institution. Mm -hmm. So everything that I did was just a matter of how can I get this person to be introduced to the people that I work with who are making such significant decisions that can actually change their lives. So whether it's a program that I'm managing or an initiative that I have or an introduction that you make to people, I feel particularly as a person of color, if you're in an institution that's largely white and well-resourced, your job is, because it's not your institution, unless it is, um, <laughs> your job is to ensure that if and when you leave that you have left four, five, six, 10, 20 people behind, mm -hmm. not just for not just for you know the altruistic reason of it all, but just even for selfish reasons. If you want to return to those resources, 20 people left behind means at least five will be there when you want to tap back into that organization. So it's sort of like, even if you thought about your own insurance policy mm -hmm. to ensure that you had access to those resources, you want to leave people behind that's going to be able to answer that call for you. So I just think that that's part of a politics that I clearly know that I have, because as I expected out of other people sometimes, it was like, you know, look of surprise or amazement or wonderment. Like, what does that mean, Shreefa? I'm like, what do you think? Why else do you think you're here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you already have the job. So now it's just really a matter of making sure that more people get into this place, right? And are able to access the resources that you have here. So I think that that's sort of where I lead from. Mm -hmm. And everything is really a manifestation of that. Um, and in terms of how you leverage your position to uh, tell your story, I think that there are so many ways it's limitless. Um, and it doesn't matter what position you have, what role you have, I think that the, the reality of power and influence should not be overlooked, and we need to lean into the real understanding and meanings of those words, because you always have power as someone who exists and lives and breathes in the world, and you always have influence, despite whether or not you have authority to make the decisions. You have power over and influence over the people who have the authority. So you have to just find the ways to either shame people into doing it, <laughs> encourage them into doing it, uh, make them reach to it joyfully. I don't know how they get there, but I think that you have a way, once you, def once you decide it's important for it to be done, your job is to make sure that your voice gets louder. And if you need more voices to join, you get them. And apply the pressure to make it happen. So I think that that is limitless in terms of how you can control that. Um, I can talk a little bit about the way I use, I leverage my current position for change. Um, but I'm, and I'm, I, I will say up front that I don't know if I'm gonna say some very popular things, <laughs> but hey, um, it is what it is. So in, in my current position um, at the public, I, uh, I spend a lot of time, as I'm sure we all do, when you're like one of the only people of color in the room, you know, yeah. doing the thing of like pointing at, like looking, being the person who is looking through that lens and reflecting it back to the room. I feel really lucky that that doesn't happen very often in my institution. Um, I am surrounded by a small army of wonderful um, colleagues of color, particularly in the artistic office, but, but um, it gets very tiring sometimes and really frustrating, um, but, um, every time I get to that place, 
I, I remember like why I am doing it and that uh, helps and remind myself of like well when I say this thing again then eventually it will stick mm -hmm. and that means that these stories are going to get told or these artists are going to get hired or we're going to change these policies and practices within our institutional culture. Um, when it comes to the, the actual work on stage, and this is the unpopular part, um, I tend to dock with uh, artists, writers, and directors, but in my current role, it's usually I'm working, <laughs> I traffic in Shakespeare a lot, so I'm, I'm specifically mm -hmm. like targeting directors for my program who um, not just, who don't just share or don't just have like lovely resumes and they don't just have the sort of ch technical chops to um, do a Shakespeare play, but they have to actually walk the walk in terms of their values and how they align with the program that I run. Um, and I, I talk about this a lot with my boss, Oscar, as we're talking about who will direct. I say, I, I've gotten better at articulating what those values are but I used to say, I used to sit in his office and say, it's just, you know, it's like they got it. <laughs> Which is to say, it is part of who they are. Mm -hmm. The values of like generosity and patience and, and, and are in their DNA. And uh, when we are casting our creative team, that is as important, if I'm really being honest, more. More important to me than what might ultimately end up on stage. Um, because that is a kind of like ripple effect. It is a lever that I can push where I decide to hire like the person who is going to not just create good art, but actually take care of the people in the room. Mm -hmm. And actually be open enough to collaboration that, w that the program gets to do what it needs to do. Um, and, then, and so, the happily, when I push that one lever, more often than not, all the other levers take care of themselves. Like I put, I hire the one person who I know is going to like get it. And then, um, then they sort of, it proliferates out from there. It's the pebble, the one pebble, and then the ripples go. Every once in a while, um, I have to remind somebody why we are doing what we're doing and the values that the program sort of like espouses and every once in a while I have to say go back to the drawing board I want to see more people of color on your creative team list I want to see more actors of color in your you know in the sort of like casting pool that we're talking about and if I hear the words like quota then I then to myself I'm like I've made a mistake here. We are not the same. If you think about that as a quota, then we are misaligned in our values. Mm -hmm. But I have no problem being like, yep, it's a quota. Now fill it. <laughs> because there is a bigger thing at work, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the vision for what the program does and who I am and the way, the way we need to activate our communities and our artists within those communities is larger than any one individual artist. And so as a leader within my institution, in my program, and in the <coughs> theater community, those are the lines, like those are the moments where I'm like, what kind of leader do I wanna be? What kind of producer do I wanna be? Am I okay with being the kind of leader to look at an artist and be like, I don't care. It's not about you at this moment. Yes, I am. <laughs> and, in a, you know, and I work in an institution where artists come, come first, so, I look rigorously for the artists who are aligned with my values and the values of the program so that I don't have to be like, because I said so, because that doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. But when push comes to shove, because I said so and fill the quota and I don't care how you feel about it, is actually like okay with me. I see some hands um, shooting up, uh, but one question that I wanted to ask our panelists is, um, for those of us who, who sit outside institutions who actually aren't going to the brick and mortar, um, how can we how can we push those levers, or how can we actually be agents of change in our communities, but don't necessarily work for a large or small institution? Do you guys have thoughts about that? I was just thinking about that. Mm -hmm. I think 
context of everything. Um, particularly when you look at that board, right, we're living in a national landscape where the national discourse is the opposite of all that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just really curious in terms of, as a community of leaders, because I, I can look around this room and recognize a lot of faces, and I know the impact that many of you guys are making across the field uh, today and, and beyond. Um, when I think about this room of leaders who are in here, like what are we thinking about in terms of 2017 mm -hmm. as the new sort of course mm -hmm. for us collectively, mm -hmm. um, knowing that that discourse nationally is really loud mm -hmm. and that many of us are outside of institutions but have a significant amount of power mm -hmm. or thinking about leaving institutions, right? Because the, the institutions aren't enough anymore. So I, 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 I pose that question almost to the collective. I'm just really curious about if we come away from today thinking about <coughs> what do we expect out of each other because I think we're going to really need to, this community has been being built over the course, over the course of, the, of the past several years. I think there's a reason for that. <laughs> I think that we've been preparing for this moment. So now that we're in it, um, what do we want to do in terms of that coalition building and collective work? I think, they're gonna... I think a, a little bit, uh, I immediately think about the stuff, some of the stuff that I said in the, my keynote speech last night, when I think about the individual levers that are available, I keep going back to that word lever, lever, but pebble or you know whatever, whatever your favorite metaphor is, the individual choices that we get to make every day, regardless of where you go to work, because we are all active participants in our communities and in the artistic community, either in New York or outside of New York. And I still think that the tiniest, it starts just like with the tiniest things, like, like how you talk about work after you see a show. It matters, and pe because people are listening, and language matters, mm -hmm. and words matter. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, there are myriad ways that uh, people can lead and activate uh, change um, without an institution, but I don't think, even within an institution, it doesn't always look like this, you know? It's like, if you're always reaching for the thing that you need somebody else's permission to do, then I feel like you're just gonna get disappointed all the time. But instead, if you're also, not, not either or, but like also looking for like, I don't need anybody else's permission or any infrastructure or any money to like decide to stop talking about new plays as being risky. You know, it's like that. <laughs> like, what are those moments? Um, and so that's how I feel like, whether you're in an institution or not, um, those I think are the, are the really like small, empowering moments that when you start to like put them all together, you sort of like, you stand taller and you take mm -hmm. up more space in whatever community you're inhabiting. Mm. That's great. Yeah, so um, I'm just mindful of time. So yeah, we have about, um, I would say about five minutes for questions um, for, uh, and also Nico. Nico also runs a company um, that's really doing great work here in New York, so feel free. Um, so yeah, let's start there. Me? Yep. Great. Um, you talked about um, being within <coughs> your organizations, and one of the things that I face continuously is being the only person and artist of color within my organization. Um, I've been there for about a year. The white privilege standard is the constant face uh, that I am challenged by. And right now, I'm bringing greater value to that organization, and I want to know how each of you perhaps have tipped that balance <coughs> so that you now get uh, uh, the balance of getting uh, more outcome oriented within the Latino community, because that's where I'm at. I'm literally that um, bridge between two, uh, the Latino community and this very powerful, long established uh, white privileged organization. Mm -hmm. And so how do you balance that power and how do you tip the scale to bring greater benefit to the Latino community or the Latino art community? It's actually a great question. I think the first thing I would say is working in isolation isn't sustainable. Um, so that um, situation of being the only person is really critical to augment change uh, a shift. And if the support is not within your organization, you have to figure out where, who are the colleagues outside of your organization who can be part of your circle, because working in isolation is not sustainable. So your first set of business <coughs> is, to find, is to find some peer groups and to create an affinity group 
Ideally, um, that includes a plan to expand the staff and diversify that staff. Um, but the immediate thing that needs to happen is identify some people that you can um, collaborate with. Um, and I think that in terms of um, context is everything again. So in terms of, I don't know where you're at and what you're doing, but I think identifying the piece that you want to share first um, is, is critical. Putting Mapping out the strategy of how you want to engage the community. Um, I, I would need to have more information to give you more specific information, but I can talk generally speaking. I think that um, there's a way for you to break down the, the meal into portions and mm -hmm. identify which portion you're going to start with um, and take it from there. But yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, I, would, I would add to that if you, if you have the kinds of relationships with your colleagues that allow you to name the privilege without being sort of accusatory, or maybe you need to be accusatory, but um, it, it is, I still get very nervous. Um, I have really excellent relationships with um, my two white male bosses um, and, um, and all of the, my colleagues, but it still gets, it's nervous making to say, this is a moment where we need to just shift our thinking because like the sort of dominant paradigm is X. I don't know that I say white privilege. I just say dominant paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So nobody's feeling mm -hmm. accused. Um, and so we might, if we shift our thinking and look through a different lens, then we might see this. Um, <coughs> But I think that the more that you can find even the small ways of naming our biases, which is a, a you know, there are so many different words for it. Yeah. And there's so many different ways to get at the product of privilege that, that doesn't have to, that uh, can also honor, uh, you know, the goodwill, the assumption of sort of like the goodwill of your colleagues, I guess. So I would, you know, explore language of biases, language of paradigms, subversive paradigms, dominant paradigms, um, and to make sure that when you are raising a flag that you're, that you're sort of tying it back to like, if we don't make this shift, like th this is what I see, dominant paradigm, so let's make this shift. Like you have to name it so that other people start to see it with you. Mm. And I think part of naming it too, just to add on to that is, uh, there is a there's a scaffolding to the work that has to occur, and one of them is deepening analysis. Because I can tell you that there's certainly uh, when I got to OSF about five years ago, I think a lot of the conversation was you know um, dominant culture X and X Y Z and the third, and now it's just white <laughs> culture and uh, white it's structural racism, and we ain't got time for this. So the, so because the analysis is deepened, we can have a conversation without defense. Mm -hmm. People understand what white supremacist culture is. Yep. They know it's not a personal attack. They understand structural racism is real. There's an understanding that we can, we can fast forward in conversations now. Mm -hmm. It's still equally as frustrating, but at least we're using language that's accurate. <coughs> um, so that's helpful. But there is a scaffolding that has to happen in order for you to begin to have these conversations. Which is helpful is though, have some colleagues that you're working with to get strategic. The, the purpose of that affinity space is to give space for strategy. And then you go and implement it. So sometimes gird yourself up and give yourself the confidence to deal with the fear that you might be facing, and then you have a sort of a board, an echo chamber that is um, supportive and allows you to continue. <coughs> to work. Oh, there's other questions, thoughts, yeah. Um, this is continuing off of what you just said. Thank you, thank you for <coughs> what both of you have said so far. <coughs> Organizations are large and complex, even with 30 people. <coughs> but then you have more, and they're not all going to move together, right? So I know even at OSF, you will be struggling with people who are going, Dominant paradigm, oh, I feel safe. Wait, we're talking white people are not safe here, right? So how do you deal with that shift where even in five years, you know, some people need another 20, and some people are like, can we go back there? I mean, look at this country, that's, you know, that, that, that yeah. was what, this was, you know, make America great again, boom. So how do you deal with the complexities of the differences of diversity within a larger community. And I think that depending on how much you care about the journey of others. So I can speak for myself uh, specifically. So the two, the two people are important for me in order for the work to move forward is our artistic director and our executive director. 
And once they have clarity, everyone else can have their own journey at their own pace. I can bring them together that, right? So the conversation that allows me to be where I need to be is directed by them. And so that's where all the resources for me go. There's 600 people at OSF, and I am not as concerned about the 598 um, outside of building business, quite frankly. So I think it just depends on how those people affect the work going further. As the culture shifts based on their leadership, based on their um, um, appointment of agency, other people that work at the organization, the other 598 will decide to either opt in or opt out. And we see people retire. We see people leave. But we also will have to see a lot of people show up. So it's just a matter of whether or not that's important to you. And for me, it's not as important. I think when you look at that through the prism of just like leadership, you just take Take diversity out of the equation for just a second and just like, you know, as a leader, how do you just, how do you make peace with the fact that wherever you're going, people are going to not be keeping pace necessarily that you want them to. Um, and I think that it's, uh, I completely agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know for me, I spend a lot of my time, if any of you have, have you, if you sent me an email in the last four or five months, we're out there, I probably not responded to it in any kind of timely fashion. I don't spend much time at my desk or in front of a computer. I spend so much of my time walking around, in meetings, sure, but also walking around the office and like sort of perching on somebody's you know couch and just chatting with them, and and that's at like all stratas of the institution, um, because that relationship building, that sort of like out no stakes kind of relationship building, let's just have a chat over coffee, helps to scaffold for the conversations that ultimately you are going to need to have you know, with your colleagues and your teammates in order to bring them along. And I, I'll give you an example. Inside of my beloved mobile unit, um, I have a lot of authority. I have a lot of formal authority. And I can say because I said so, and if, I, if that doesn't work, then I have a very, like a six foot three bearded man standing right behind me, and I can usually be like, because he said so, you know? But that is not, as a leader, that is not a place that feels good, and it's not, I don't feel like it is the most effective um, for the long-term change, yeah? So when, uh, when we started our mobile, our, our mobile unit program, uh, we, we do three weeks out on tour, and then we bring it back down to the public theater where you perform for three weeks inside of the building. I can do whatever the hell I want outside of the building. I don't have to really ask anybody. There's no really other key stakeholders. You know, like I could just like run the show. It's really lovely. When I get in the building, there's like a multiplicity of like <laughs> departments and people who have opinions and da da da. And there is a dominant culture, like the way we welcome our audiences, the way we sit together, all the things. It is does me zero good to say to our director of uh, audience services or our house managers, um, you will let them take pictures, you will let them drink their drinks, and you, like, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So instead, I sit down for like multiple, over multiple productions, multiple conversations, just sitting around a table. Let me tell you why um, it is important that we welcome our audiences in this slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Does that not work for you? What's hard about that? Ah, I think I can make that easier. Okay, we can let that go, but this is the part that feels really important, right? And over the course, of it took probably three um, productions, three mobile unit shows, so that's like a year and a half. I, I now walk into the public theater during our sit-down runs, and our front of house staff, people I have not spoken to about this, are like, I'm looking at the camera, Breaking fire code laws, you know, like move, like do. They, they are making individual choices, reasonable choices that do not affect people's safety, really. <laughs> <laughs> to physically make space for more people, they are engaging with our audiences in different ways, and that could not have come from a unilateral decision, top down. That had to come from like some 
you know, not quite peer to peer, but some collegial sort of relationship building and then permeate out from there. And it required listening, it required dialogue, and it required that thing I also said yes, distance. That's not gonna work for me. That flies in the face of, you know, you know, house manager's values or whatever. Okay, I hear that. That's cool. Let's think about a different way then, right? Because here's the ultimate goal. Now how what are your ideas for how we get there? So I feel like you can apply that um, to any given, you know, whether it's diversity or whatever kind of cultural change. Um, but I also think that the, that because I said so, which is, to me is like a nuclear option, but it's a perfectly reasonable option, where you leave, where you're sort of like, I don't care what the other five ninety would say, because there are those moments too. <coughs> Anything else? Yeah. Um, so I'm in Brooklyn College right now, studying performing arts management, and I'll actually be at the public next year in January in fundraising. So, um, but so my class is mainly white. There's five of us in the first year, and then six in the second year, and we were having these conversations in class about different aspects of the theater industry and different things that are going on. And one of them was on diversity. Um, and at one point in the conversation, it came to be that most of my classmates were like, they're waking, waking up and are like, oh, there's so many problems, there's, you know, what are we gonna, but there's no solutions really. And I was like, there's so many things we could do and it all comes from inclusivity really. And it's like, look around this room, we probably should have more people of color in our classroom, that's one thing. Um, but I don't know, I guess, it, and then even my professor was like, it, isn't it interesting that the one person who actually deals with all these things finds many solutions? Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, I guess it's like, how do you deal with people who once they are getting waken up, w woke from these issues, don't feel like they can do anything, you know, need, need like specific things that need to happen? Speak on that, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finding the urge to call on two people to speak on that. <laughs> I see three, four, or five people. Here. Um, so I'm gonna call on Michael, Mary Lee, Gabriel, Elisa, Amelia, <laughs> anyone of y'all. Take that one. Um, I think it's engaging in people in this room, finding those people that do this work, know how to speak to it, and. I do a lot of outreach. We, I did a with Sharifa yesterday. We did a went to a Manhattan Borough Community College just to do what we do in our fair program outreach and empowered the, our young people of color to get involved. You know, we're here for them. We're, I lend myself as a resource all the time. Um, it's like saying here, golden ticket. Um, this like. Stephanie says, like, it's hard to, I don't ask for permission anymore. I just say, this is going to happen. <laughs> you know, I just, I don't say, do you think I can, can I do, you know, it's no more, I'm not inferior anymore. I'm, you know, I stand on my own ground and say, this is, this is what's going to happen. This is what I'm going to do. Um, making those connections, making sure you know everybody in your institution, know everybody in your community, know the biggest this is one thing I'm starting to do is even I'm talking to police chiefs in our in, our, in the Rose Valley and like mm -hmm. challenging them on their biases and mm -hmm. getting community members, community, um, this community uh, organizations that we have being a member of them and saying let's let's collectively start moving forward. So it's like empowering yourself through others is what it is and being st strategic. And I think it's great that how Stephanie said she didn't agree, that's perfect because you need people that are gonna be the ambassador for that work in that way to be like, yeah, I'm gonna listen to you. And then you have someone that's like, I'm, not, I'm done talking to those people, I'm not. Because that energy needs to be focused on like that's the person manning the guns, you know. You don't mess with that person there. You know that's <laughs> they're, they're at battle stations. Let them do their work. Let the you know let the lieutenant take care of what needs you know directing orders. Let's communicate with that person. So everyone has a role in a different way, and we have to respect that. And that you know when people get up out of the room because they're done, I'll stay there on purpose 
because I know strategically people are, you know, what we call the white fragility will land on me and then I'll delegate how that white fragility gets dealt with and be mm -hmm. like, how can we use this white fragility? I'll say, well, we got a lot of campaigns. Put your money, put that, you know, manifest Whoa. that. I was so taken by the white fragility. <laughs> well, <I'm just> like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I I've learned to strategize how to take that white fragility and manifest it into the, to see some money to, you know, give me that white fragility. Yeah. I'm going to take that, let's see it in dollar form. Let's mm -hmm. put it into this program and that program. So what I hear you saying too, Gabriel, is just, again, just to like focus that in on yeah. leadership in, and whether it's like dealing with diversity or whatever, whatever. What you've done is position yourself as a resource. Mm -hmm. Right. And when we look at all of those words, like if you are going to like assume a leadership role, then at some point you have to be okay with being the resource yes. and, and creating the like your army, right? right. And so, uh, and redirecting people's energy. So that, like, I just want to call that out in what you're saying is like, right. as a leader in your community, you have positioned yourself in a way that people are like, I'm gonna go talk to him. Right. Yeah? Even though you don't right. hold the power, but you, you right. create this power by influence right. and who you know. You may not you have know. the formal authority, but you may have the informal right. authority <coughs> and influence to help affect change right. wherever you are in the change. Absolutely. Mm. Just, uh, and apologies for coming in late. Um, just want to riff off of what uh, Gabriel was saying a little bit. I think so much of this work, um, there also is a big piece of self work that has to be done yeah. that you can't commit to service without knowing deeply yourself and what your limits are and what your role is. Uh, that not everybody is going to be the right person to be on the front lines and pick up the gun or, or pick up a fist or do whatever. You need the nurturers, uh -huh. you know, you need the incubators, you need the, the cooks and the chefs who are going to feed people, you need, you know. And so a lot of deep thought has got to go into what is the role that I have within this struggle here. Um, and what is kind of the mini community, again, that I can build of the people around me who I don't have all the skills and I want to make sure, I can nurture, but sometimes I really want to fight too. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I've got <coughs> all these elements around me so that I don't have to do it all myself and I could go, okay, well you're really good at that. So if we did this together, then we're going to balance off of each other. Um, but that knowing thyself piece, and I think we give a lot of lip service to core values. Mm -hmm. um, it is hard, hard work. It is what you're going to go to the mat for. Mm -hmm. It is knowing, okay, if I'm going to put on a safety pin, what does that mean? Am I really going to be willing to then be a bodyguard and physically put my physical self in front of somebody else to defend them? Uh, you know, am I willing to do that? It's deep, hard work, and you have to do that before you can do, or alongside, the work of service. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter where you are in your career, it's, it's an ongoing um, mm -hmm. life lesson and life work. Uh, I know that you're earlier in your career, I'm later in my career, but I think there are blind spots and pieces of things that I need deep work on still. Beautifully, beautifully said, mm -hmm. and I feel like, <clears throat> I think with that, I want to uh, move us to our next, it's just because we have about 30 minutes left, um, and I want to, I want us to do a little bit of group work, so um, thank you, it was beautiful, and thank you all, uh, thank you panelists, thank amazing, you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that for part two after lunch, we can maybe continue part of this conversation when we come back and look at specifically mentorship relative to leadership and how that's another lever, level, lever uh, to uh, affect change. So I'm gonna count you off into uh, groups of uh, four. We're gonna have two groups in here, so maybe one group here, one group, so group one here, group two here, and then three and four out in the lobby space. Um, and what I want you to do with your group is to actually start to, as a group, think about what it means for your group to be an agent of change. And then, what I want your group to also do, and this is sort of hard, and I realize that it's hard because you have limited time, come up with a mission statement. An agent of change in the American theater is. And that, and then we're gonna share. So we're gonna have four mission statements, okay? Are the instructions clear? Yes. yes?
Excellent. <laughs> so we're going to start here. Again, uh, we're going to count off in fours. One. One. Two.